No, no, no. Just, just cancel the sea lion delivery. It, I, I don't want any penguins either, but that's not relevant. Just, I don't need the sea lion. Maybe later, just not now. Okay. September 21st, 1940. Last week, the British were very worried about imminent German invasion. And now this week, this week, that German invasion is postponed. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Battle of a Hundred Regiments continued in Northeast China. The Battle of Britain continued in the skies above Britain, with the British worried that a German invasion by land was imminent. Adolf Hitler delayed that invasion though, but an Italian one began in Egypt. That invasion, however, stalls already after a few days. Some five Italian divisions set up defensively the 16th after advancing to Sidi Barani. The Italians do not approach the main British positions at Mersa Matru. On the 17th, British planes from the carrier Illustrious, backed by the battleship Valiant, attack Benghazi. Four Italian ships are sunk at harbor. Remember we also saw last week that Italy was building up its forces in Albania? Well, on the 19th, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop meets Italian leader Benito Mussolini and Italian Foreign Minister Galeazzo Ciano in Rome and warns them not to attack Greece or Yugoslavia. The Italians say they will conquer Egypt first. But both their invasion plans there and the German ones for Britain are bumpy. In the Battle of Britain, James Holland describes the state of readiness of the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, for an invasion of Britain. By last week, mine barrages had been laid in the waters along the flanks. Transport for the invasion forces had been assembled, although it had some problems. Half of the barges had no engines, and those with engines were not powerful enough to cross the channel on their own. So 350 tugboats had been assembled, and each one would tow one barge with an engine and one without an engine. Those with engines would be cut loose upon reaching the English coast to make the landings under their own steam. Many of the barges were not in the proper ports for invasion anyhow, but in spite of all sorts of logistical problems, Grand Admiral Erich Reder is pretty optimistic about the whole thing. This is somewhat surprising, since he's been one of the biggest skeptics the whole time about the overall plans. He tells Hitler, if air supremacy is increasingly established, it will be possible to be ready by the new date. He thinks the invasion can work. Well. That does put Hitler in front of a big decision. To attack and fail would be a disaster, but to abandon the invasion would kind of also be a disaster. That would mean that the war would continue into 1941 and Britain would get stronger and American levels of military production would continue to increase and outstrip the German ones. And the USSR isn't just sitting idle, they are also beefing up their military. And though Hitler wants to attack in the East next year, if he has to fight the Soviets, he'll have a two-front war, and he damn sure does not want that. But the Luftwaffe have to clear the air over Britain. The 15th is the day for the next great aerial attack. Albert Kesselring's planes make a huge effort. He plans two main raids, but they cannot be timed to catch the RAF on the ground while it's refueling because he has to use the same fighters both times. He doesn't have enough planes otherwise. He has 400 fighters and 200 bombers for the morning raid. His planes are harried though the entire trip from the coast to London and back, and none can accurately drop their bombs. British Fighter Command had early warning of the raids, and many of the forward airfields damaged last month have by now been repaired. Also, British Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding gives permission for number 12 Group Midlands to send its squadrons in as defensive aid. Actually, Prime Minister Winston Churchill visits 11 Group, responsible for London in the Southeast, at Uxbridge and asks Group Commander Keith Park, what other reserves have we? He gets the same answer he'd gotten from Maurice Gamelan in France four months ago. There are none. But this time, the decision is a calculated one and turns out to be justified by the results. The 60 German planes shot down that day mark a spectacular defeat. Also, many bombers are damaged and many German crewmen wounded or killed. The RAF loses 26 planes. German morale takes a hard hit as their pilots have been repeatedly assured that Britain has fewer than 300 fighters in total left, but they meet more than that on just one raid. In fact, the RAF has 659 fighters ready to take off. 
Also, between September 7th and 15th, the Luftwaffe loses 175 planes. That is far more than their factories build. Two days later, Hitler announces that Operation Sea Lion, the invasion, is postponed indefinitely. The hope that British resistance could be broken before invasion season ends was in vain. Hitler tells Karl von Puttkammer, naval aide, we have conquered France at the cost of 30,000 men. During one night of crossing the channel, we could lose many times that and success is not certain. On the 17th, German invasion flotillas are attacked by British bomber command at night and take a fair amount of damage. Polish pilots attack the docks at Boulogne, one saying, our boys dived like mad, tearing basin number six to bits, together with dozens of boats prepared for the invasion. The Germans raid Clydeside that night, damaging the cruiser Sussex. Operation Eagle, the aerial campaign, is not to be terminated though. Luftwaffe commander Hermann Goering meets his unit commanders the 16th and blames them for not achieving a decisive result during the raids of the day before. The thing is, a lot of the fighters had flown away from the bombers they were escorting to take on the British fighters. So ace pilot Adolf Galland asks, is the purpose of the attacks to bomb London or to destroy fighter command? They are not the same thing. What had been the point of attacking London two times the day before? Just what were they trying to achieve? The subjugation of the British people or the destruction of the RAF? Operationally, the Luftwaffe was in a mess, short of aircraft and lacking the infrastructure needed to continue a battle of this intensity. Tactically, the thinking was faulty, as the high command failed to use either bombers or fighters to their best capabilities. Operationally, it was struggling, and strategically, it had lost sight of what it was supposed to be achieving. Believing the German Air Force was within sight of victory was a fool's dream. The Luftwaffe was not on the verge of triumph. Rather, it was further away than ever. But the bombing continues day after day after day. On the 19th, actually, Germany's Welsh agent Arthur Owens, who, as we've seen, has in fact been working for the British the whole time, starts transmitting reports recommending targets for German bombers. The list of targets has been made for Owens by the British Air Ministry. Also that day, another German spy, an actual one, named Wolf Schmidt, parachutes into Britain. He is quickly caught, though, and is persuaded to change sides, and soon begins sending back messages as a double agent. He will become so successful as paymaster to other German spies who have also been turned that Germany will one day award him the Iron Cross First Class. So, what will Hitler do about Britain with invasion postponed? John Keegan writes, Hitler fell into a characteristic pattern of evade and delay. It had overcome him for weeks after the Polish triumph, when he had fenced with his generals over the strategy for an attack on the Western Allies. It had seized him in an acute form twice during the Battle of France, once before and once during the attack on the Dunkirk perimeter. Now it was manifested in a search for means of winning the war by broadening its base. If he could not talk the British round or defeat them by invasion, he would achieve the same effect by multiplying the enemies they had to face and the fronts on which they had to fight. Like Mussolini's invasion of Egypt, Hitler is beginning to think how the Mediterranean might be turned to Britain's disadvantage and how Spain might be brought into the war. Could the Germans then use Gibraltar? Others are thinking about men that might possibly be brought into a war this week. On the 15th, the USSR modifies army conscription and begins conscripting 19 and 20 year olds. That same day, Canada announces that single men between 21 and 24 are to be called up. On the 16th, the Selective Training and Services Act introduces peacetime conscription in the United States for the first time in its history, the compulsory induction of all males between 21 and 35. Even the Japanese are reinforcing. In phase two of the Battle of the Hundred Regiments, they are now beginning to reinforce their men in the field from the larger city garrisons. The Chinese communists continue their work attacking strong points in contested regions. Serious confrontations are only a matter of time. And here are a few notes to end the week. On the 17th, the city of Benares en route to Canada is torpedoed in the Atlantic. 217 adults and 77 children drown. On the 18th, 
Radio Belgique begins broadcasting to occupied Belgium from London. And at the end of the week, convoy HX-72 is attacked by a U-boat group, the Wolf Pack. Twelve ships of 78 tons are sunk. Seven during the second night of the attack by Joachim Schepke's U-100 alone. And so the week ends, with the Germans taking heavy losses in the British skies and postponing their invasion, the Italians halting theirs and the Japanese reinforcing theirs. Postponed is not the same thing as cancelled, of course, and the bombing raids on British cities will continue. But, as Martin Gilbert writes, The roar of German panzers, the screech of German dive bombers, the march of German soldiers, all of which had brought the horrors of conquest and the curse of occupation to Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France would not be heard in Britain, not at least in 1940. If you'd like to know more about those countries which were invaded and what horrors the population had to endure while being occupied, check out our War Against Humanities episode about the Nazi terror in occupied territory here. Any minute now. And make sure to check out our Instagram page where we post about the war on a daily basis. You can find the link below. Our patron of the week is Joseph Vigno. Do like Joseph and join the Time Ghost Army via patreon.com or timeghost.tv. That support is what keeps this show running. Subscribe, click the bell. See you next time. Mm -hmm.